This is the story of the Mount Erebus disaster, one of the deadliest plane crashes in history and one of the biggest scandals in New Zealand history. The tragedy of the 257 people who perished in the plane crash was overshadowed by a public blame game that went on for years after the crash. This is the story of not only how the plane crash occurred, but the shocking allegations of a corporate cover-up, a shady investigation, and lies being spewed at the highest level of the federal government. In February 1977, Air New Zealand introduced to the world its sightseeing flights over Antarctica. It would be an 11-hour non-stop flight from New Zealand, flown in the McDonnell Douglas DC-1030 trijet, and would run on a schedule of four flights every year in the early summer. Every crew member from the airline was eager to work the Antarctic flights, and only the airline's most senior pilots were allowed to fly them. Tickets for the trip were over $200, more than double the average Kiwi's weekly income in the late 70s. It wasn't a typical commercial flight. It was promoted as an experience of a lifetime. The entire aircraft was essentially a first-class cabin. Champagne was flowing, there was a fine dining menu, passengers were free to walk around the cabin and allowed to visit the cockpit to meet the pilots. And there was an Antarctic expert on board who provided commentary like a tour guide pointing out landmarks such as glaciers of Victoria Land, McMurdo Station, the US Research Base, Scott Base, the New Zealand one, and the 12,000 feet tall active volcano, Mount Erebus. Sir Edmund Hillary, famous for being the first man to climb Mount Everest, had been the guide on several flights. The Air New Zealand Antarctic flights attracted tourists and adventure seekers from all around the world, who wanted to see the incredible icy, isolated landscape. On the 28th of November 1979, the final flight of the year was about to depart. By now, Air New Zealand had run the Antarctic trip over a dozen times, and there were rumours that this would be the final one, due to the oil crisis raising the cost of jet fuel. Flight 901 left Auckland International Airport at 8am with 237 passengers and 20 crew on board. The captain was 45-year-old Jim Collins, an experienced pilot who had accumulated 11,151 flight hours. And the first officer was 37-year-old Greg Casson, who had 7,934 flight hours under his belt. But neither of them had ever flown to Antarctica. Everything went as normal that morning. Passengers were enjoying themselves and the weather conditions were excellent. At around midday, the passengers would get their first glimpse of the continent of Antarctica. At around 2 p.m. New Zealand time, the plane lost radio contact with air traffic control at McMurdo Station, even though it was only a short distance away. A US Navy plane that was flying nearby made a brief search around the station, but couldn't spot the Air New Zealand DC-10 plane anywhere. Two more American helicopters and two planes were deployed to search, but they couldn't see the DC-10 either. Scott Base deployed all of their helicopters as well, and Mountaineers working on site were put on standby in case the DC-10 showed up. It was utterly bizarre that all radio contact had been lost with Flight 901. By 4 p.m., air traffic control at Auckland Airport was getting extremely concerned. Flight 901 should have been en route for home by now, but they hadn't heard from them yet. At 8 p.m., Maria Collins, the wife of the captain, received a phone call from Air New Zealand Flight Operations, informing her that her husband's plane was unaccounted for. They kept the call very vague, but advised her to have someone with her. Primetime News was reporting that an Air New Zealand plane was missing, but there were no details about what had happened. Families of passengers who were waiting at Christchurch Airport and Auckland Airport were not told the reason for the delay. At 9.30pm, there was still no sign of the plane, which would have been out of fuel at this point. It was clear something had gone very wrong. Friends and family of the passengers could do nothing but speculate about what had happened and hope for the best. Finally, at 1am, there was news. The wreckage of Flight 901 had been sighted on the north side of Ross Island. The plane had crashed directly into Mount Erebus. There were no survivors. First-hand accounts from the search party that found the wreckage were harrowing. 
It was described as a black smear on the ice. The plane had crashed into the slope of Mount Erebus in a nose up position. The aircraft had disintegrated all over the ice and it was believed that many of those on board would have been standing up at the moment of impact and would have died instantly. As the recovery plan was beginning to be put into action, the general public back in New Zealand were waking up to the news of the shocking tragedy. Operation Overdue was the codename given for the massive response launched as soon as the crash site was discovered, and by all accounts, it sounded like a total hellscape. A team of 60 recovery workers, including mountaineers who were stationed on Ross Island, New Zealand police officers, and US Navy personnel spent weeks recovering as many of the 257 bodies as they could. The crash site had been divided into 30 meter square grids. The team got to work digging through rubble and debris, flagging bodies and body parts, and collecting personal belongings. The frozen corpses and body parts strewn all over the mountain had to be carefully chipped out of the ice and placed into body bags before seabirds could pick at them. Many bodies were stuck under pieces of fuselage or down deep crevasses and required considerable physical effort to retrieve. There was a shortage of water on the site and workers would get covered in human grease, a black substance that came from burns on the corpses mixed with jet fuel that they could not wash off. Unsurprisingly, almost everyone involved in Operation Overdue developed post-traumatic stress disorder. The bodies were then all carefully flown to Auckland, transported in refrigerated trucks and multiple ambulances into the city's hospitals. A team of pathologists, dentists, and police then painstakingly identified the bodies. All but 44 were able to be identified. Ron Chippendale, New Zealand's chief air accident investigator, and his team had also arrived at the site to examine the wreckage and determine what exactly had happened. Since it was a sightseeing flight, almost every passenger had a camera with them, and several rolls of undeveloped film were able to be salvaged. Most crucially, the DC-10's two black boxes were recovered, so the audio recording from the final moments of Flight 901 could be analyzed. The black boxes were flown to the United States for transcribing. Black boxes of this time recorded everything that was said in the cockpit, but only on a 30 minute loop. The sound quality was very poor and it took six days for the 30 minute long tape to be transcribed. Four Air New Zealand pilots were also flown to the US to assist with writing the transcript as they knew the men on the recording well and could differentiate between their voices and accents. Along with trained voice analysts, the four pilots listened to the voices of their dead colleagues hundreds, if not thousands of times, to create an accurate transcript of the final moments before the crash. As per the protocol, the transcript was handwritten by one person so it would be clear if it had been edited by someone else. The Air New Zealand pilots were told that the transcript would get typed up, then they would be asked back for one last check before it would be finalized as the official black box transcript. However, the men were never called back. More on this later. On the recording, the alarm from the ground proximity warning system could be heard warning over and over that the plane was dangerously close to terrain. The pilots and flight engineers try to figure out why the warning system was sounding. The Antarctic expert on board, Peter Mulgrew, can be heard saying that Mount Erebus is 20 to 25 miles to their left, so that couldn't possibly be the higher ground that they are too close to. Captain Jim Collins calmly gives directions to apply maximum thrust and pull up while the alarm is still beeping, when suddenly, Bang. They had flown straight into the slopes of Mount Erebus. There was no mechanical failure, no freak snowstorm, no mention of Erebus right in front of them. So how did Captain Collins, First Officer Cassin, and the two flight engineers not see the giant volcano? Nobody was shouting in the cockpit, passengers weren't screaming, there was zero panic at all. Ron Chippendale was New Zealand's chief air accident investigator, the man everyone involved in the investigation was reporting to, and the man who was compiling the official accident report. He was a pilot in the Royal New Zealand Air Force for 20 years and had been in the head air crash investigation job for four years, but his department had never had to deal with a catastrophe of this magnitude, and they were ill-equipped for it. In 1979, 
Air New Zealand was entirely owned by the New Zealand government and was on the brink of financial collapse due to the oil crisis and industrial disputes. New Zealand's Prime Minister at the time, the brash and controversial Robert Muldoon, was an aviation enthusiast and close personal friend of the Air New Zealand Chief Executive, Maury Davis. Muldoon famously did not get along with journalists, and when the Erebus crash happened, he was hostile and dismissive towards journalists seeking a statement from him. He did not want the airline to immediately take responsibility for the disaster, as they'd likely have to pay out millions of dollars in insurance and damages, and also ruin their reputation. Over the next six months, Air New Zealand and the government didn't offer any explanation about how the crash had happened, and the media could only speculate about a string of mechanical failures that were associated with DC-10s operated by other airlines. In early 1980, the Auckland Star newspaper reported that the navigational information entered into Flight 901's computer had been changed shortly before the flight. Air New Zealand Chief Executive Maury Davis was forced to respond for the first time and denied what the newspaper was claiming. Quote, The navigational information and the flight plan for the aircraft which crashed was accurate and entirely in order, he said. Meanwhile, Ron Chippendale was still busy working on the official accident report. As a part of his investigation, he had paid a visit to the home of Jim and Maria Collins. He asked Maria for Jim's Atlas of New Zealand, a book of maps he had received as a gift from Maria's parents years ago. Jim Collins had apparently brought the Atlas to a briefing before the flight to Antarctica, and there was a chance he had taken notes in it that could aid in understanding the cause of the crash. Maria told Chippendale that she saw her husband plot the flight path in the Atlas, but he had taken it with him and it was lost. But Chippendale didn't believe her. On the 20th of March 1980, Maria Collins had gone out to celebrate her birthday. It was the first time she had gone out since her husband was killed. When she returned home, the power had been cut and her house had been broken into. Sheets of paper had been scattered on the staircase and passports, a tape recorder and a digital clock were missing but Maria's jewelry, which was in the same drawer as the passports, was left untouched. She found a photo of her husband torn to pieces and placed back in the envelope where it was kept. To this day, the break-in of the Collins home remains unsolved, but it would be just one of many shady subplots in the Erebus story. On the 12th of June, 1980, Ron Chippendale's official accident report was released. It concluded that the foremost cause of the crash was pilot error. Jim Collins was at fault for flying at a dangerously low altitude when he wasn't certain of his location. The entire report is 100 pages long, so here's an outline of the findings that led Chippendale to this conclusion. Number 1. Captain Jim Collins' decision to descend below the minimum safe altitude MSA, set by Air New Zealand. The airline set an MSA of 16,000 feet for the Antarctic sightseeing flights and allowed an MSA of 6,000 feet only if weather conditions were good, in order to give passengers a better view. Flight 901 had struck Erebus at an altitude of just 1,467 feet, about the same altitude a modern commercial plane would be four minutes before landing. Ron Chippendale stated in his report that Captain Jim Collins violated the airline's rules when he descended below 1,500 feet, and called this the quote, initiating factor in the crash. However, Collins was actually given the all clear from McMurdo Station air traffic control to descend down to 1500 feet, a fact that Chippendale mentioned but dismissed as irrelevant. Number two, a peculiar weather phenomenon known as a white out played a trick on the pilot's vision and they were unable to see Mount Erebus directly in front of them. The weather conditions on the day of the crash were actually fairly clear, and according to McMurdo Station Air Traffic Control, visibility was good at 40 miles. It was a slight overcast day with low clouds hanging at about 2,000 feet and only light snowfall, so it was puzzling why the pilots didn't see Mount Erebus. As heard on the black box recording, the pilots took the plane below the layer of cloud down to 1,500 feet, so the passengers would get a clearer view of Antarctica. The Chippendale report goes into detail about how the whiteout effect would have occurred. Sunlight penetrated through the layer of overcast clouds and reflected off the massive surface of pure white ice below, then bounced back off the underside of the cloud layer. 
As the light bounced between these two surfaces over and over, all shadows disappeared and it played a trick on the human eye. The horizon and any other contours and features of the terrain disappeared into what would have looked like a completely white expanse ahead. So as Flight 901 rapidly approached the slopes of Mount Erebus, it was most likely that the crew in the cockpit saw only total whiteness and were under the illusion that they were flying over flat sea ice. Number 3. Despite issues with the navigational data, Captain Jim Collins' inability to ascertain his location was the primary reason why the plane crashed. Here is where things get really controversial and complicated. The first thing to explain is that every commercial flight path is made up of a series of coordinates called waypoints. These are latitudes and longitudes. These waypoints are plotted in the aircraft's onboard navigational computer system, and a pilot can choose to switch to autopilot to let the aircraft follow the waypoints on its own. The route of the Air New Zealand Antarctic flights were a bit different to other commercial flights because they were sightseeing tours. Once the plane reached McMurdo Sound, it would usually just fly around for a bit while passengers looked out the window. Then it would turn around and head back north. So the destination waypoint wasn't an airport or specific location, but rather it served as a guide to get the plane into the area. The majority of pilots who had flown the Antarctic route never actually took the plane to the destination waypoint and never saw what was there. So let's go back to 1977, when Air New Zealand first introduced its Antarctic sightseeing program. The approved flight path started from New Zealand and went pretty much directly south towards McMurdo Sound, which is a U-shaped inlet. Ross Island is situated near the bottom of the U, and both McMurdo Station and Scott Base are located at the southern tip of the island. The final destination waypoint was positioned at McMurdo Station. In other words, the flight path went right down the middle of Ross Island, directly over Mount Erebus. The MSA of 16,000 feet was in force because Mount Erebus was 12,500 feet high. But as mentioned, pilots were allowed to fly down to 6,000 feet once they reached McMurdo Sound if the weather permitted. These waypoints were then programmed into the plane's navigation system. But, almost every previous Air New Zealand Antarctic flight had approached McMurdo Sound with Ross Island coming into view on the left-hand side, not directly beneath. It turned out that shortly after the success of the first couple of Antarctic flights, the approved coordinates had been incorrectly programmed into the airline's computer. The final waypoint had been typed incorrectly, a typo a difference of two degrees longitude that shifted the flight path 27 miles to the west down the middle of McMurdo Sound over flat sea ice. The erroneous destination waypoint had been used for two seasons of the Antarctic flights, but nobody noticed the mistake since pilots would usually start flying the plane manually before reaching the waypoint so passengers could get the best view of the sights below. This erroneous flight path was presented to Captain Jim Collins and First Officer Greg Casson during a briefing on the 9th of November. Then at some point, this error had been noticed. And the night before Flight 901, the plane's navigation system was updated to the correct, approved course. We'll go into how all this happened in greater detail soon. But for now, the important thing to know is Captain Collins and First Officer Casson were not informed of the correction prior to the departure of Flight 901. In his final moments, Captain Collins locked the plane's autopilot onto the adjusted waypoint, unaware that they would now be flying over Ross Island. McMurdo Station Air Traffic Control had let him know that visibility was good and so he began to descend to 1500 feet, not knowing that he was approaching Mount Erebus straight ahead. When the ground proximity warning alarm started sounding, Captain Collins responded and attempted to pull up to a climb, but it was too late. The steep mountain slope caught up to the plane and could not be avoided. The Chippendale report acknowledged that Air New Zealand was at fault for briefing the pilots with maps with the incorrect flight path, but ultimately put the blame on Captain Collins for not being certain of their position and choosing to descend to a dangerously low altitude anyway. After the report came out, the media began reporting that pilot error was the reason for the crash and the complexities of the navigational error were buried. 
By mid-1980, the New Zealand public believed that Jim Collins' lapse in judgment caused the catastrophe. The Chippendale report was thorough, but a disaster of this magnitude required further investigation, particularly because there were still many unanswered questions. The Chippendale report failed to explain how the error in the coordinates had not been noticed for two years, or how it had even occurred in the first place. The report also failed to explain why the pilots were not notified when the mistake was picked up the day before the flight. In July 1980, the New Zealand government appointed Justice Peter Mann to lead the Royal Commission of Inquiry and determine once and for all the cause of the crash. It would be a much broader, independent one-man inquiry, and Justice Mann would be able to access any Air New Zealand employee as well as anyone else he thought would be relevant to the investigation. Peter Mann knew it would be a big task, but he was expecting to more or less confirm the findings in the Chippendale report and maybe fill in a few gaps. He had no idea the monster he was about to uncover and the consequences it would have on his own life. It wasn't a trial, but there were two clear sides. The airline, Air New Zealand, and its top level personnel who argued that the crash was due to pilot error, and on the other side, there were the lawyers representing the dead pilots, along with the International Pilots Union, who argued that Jim Collins and Greg Casson were misled by the information given to them by the airline. 50 witnesses were interviewed. 300 exhibits were presented. The transcript of the proceedings is over 2,000 pages long, and Justice Peter Mann made a trip to Antarctica to see for himself what conditions were like. So let's cut to the chase. The Marne Report was released on the 27th of April 1981, after four deadline extensions. Marne cleared the pilots of any blame for the crash and concluded that the main cause of the crash was the change of the waypoint coordinates in the plane's navigation system and the failure to inform the pilots. He went on to make some very dangerous allegations about Air New Zealand as well. But let's first go over the evidence that led to this conclusion. Number 1. Pilots were not at fault for flying at an altitude of 1,500 feet. Top-level Air New Zealand personnel were aware of low flying and informally approved of it. Les Simpson, an Air New Zealand pilot who had flown to Antarctica in the past, testified that the minimum safe altitude rule was generally disregarded once the plane reached McMurdo Sound, and it was up to the pilot to communicate with McMurdo Station Air Traffic Control to get clearance to descend if the weather was fine. Ross Johnson, the manager of the Antarctic flights who ran the briefings, was then caught lying on the stand regarding the altitude rules. He initially denied any knowledge of low flying, but then admitted it had been discussed among top-level management. But he never once advised pilots to stop going below the MSA. After all, this was a tourist flight, and if conditions were safe, pilots would descend to a low altitude to give passengers a better view. He also admitted he had flown below 6,000 feet during an Antarctic trip himself. There were several different publications that covered previous Air New Zealand Antarctic trips that described low flying at altitudes of 2,000 feet, 1,300 feet, and even as low as 650 feet. The most damning article came from the September 1978 issue of Travelling Times magazine, which was owned by Air New Zealand. It was written by John Brizendine, the then president of McDonnell Douglas, the manufacturer of the DC-10 plane. Brizendine also happened to be a close personal friend of Air New Zealand Chief Executive Maury Davis. The story was about Brizendine's own trip to Antarctica and included references to flying at the low altitude of 3,000 feet. This particular issue of the magazine got a large print run and a copy was sent to every single household in New Zealand. On the witness stand, Maury Davis said he had never read the article. Number 2. Air New Zealand had been warned about the potential danger of whiteout conditions, but never trained their pilots. There was much debate about weather conditions on the day of the crash. The airline tried to argue that conditions were thick and visibility was poor, but there wasn't much evidence to support this claim. Plus, weather reports, testimonies from those working at the Antarctic bases, and photographs from Flight 901 passengers all supported the fact that conditions were clear when the plane was approaching the area. 
It came out that Air New Zealand had never trained their pilots about the whiteout effect, despite recommendations from Antarctic experts. And now they were trying to cover their tracks. Remember the four Air New Zealand pilots who spent six days in the US transcribing the black box recording? After they had finalized the transcript, Ron Chippendale brought the black boxes to the UK without telling the pilots. Remember, the pilots were never called back for one final check of the transcript before it was typed up and published in the official report. Chippendale enlisted a British voice analyst who did not know the men in the cockpit of Flight 901 to have a crack at deciphering the recording. A different version of the transcript ended up getting published in the report. One particular change sparked outrage among the four pilots who worked on the original version. It was a line initially marked as unintelligible by the pilots, but somehow the British voice analyst had interpreted it as bit thick here, eh Bert? The speaker was unidentified, but it meant someone in the cockpit was remarking on the poor visibility, which implied that the pilot should have known not to continue at the low altitude. The problem was, nobody in the crew was named Bert. Number 3. A series of mistakes in the navigational data It was time to find answers to the burning questions. How did a careless mistake get made in something as crucial as the coordinates of a flight path? And how did this mistake go unnoticed for so long? Why were Captain Jim Collins and First Officer Greg Casson not notified when the error was rectified? Air New Zealand's Chief Navigator Brian Hewitt took the stand to explain how this all happened. In 1977, the flight path for Air New Zealand's Antarctic tours was set. The original route would take the plane directly over Mount Erebus to the final waypoint at the runway near the southern tip of Ross Island called Williams Field. For later trips, the final waypoint was moved to a non-directional beacon or NDB at McMurdo Station. So remember, the NDB is where the final waypoint was supposed to be on the approved flight path. When the Antarctic sightseeing flights began growing in popularity, the airline decided to store the flight path into the company computer as it would be used regularly in the future. Brian Hewitt's job was to key in the coordinates of each waypoint, but he made two mistakes. The first mistake was that he used the original Williams Field waypoint for the final waypoint instead of the NDB. This wasn't a huge deal as it was only a couple of miles off. The second error was a typo when he keyed in the coordinates of the Williams Field waypoint. Instead of typing in a longitude of 16648 degrees, he typed 16448 degrees. This was a much bigger difference of 27 miles west to a random location in the middle of McMurdo Sound. Hewitt didn't notice the mistake even when he checked over the numbers, then nobody else picked it up either, so the error stayed in the system for the entirety of the 1978 and 1979 seasons. On November 9th, 1979, Les Simpson, Jim Collins, Greg Casson, and a couple of other pilots attended the same briefing for their upcoming Antarctic flights. The briefing was led by two executive pilots, John Wilson and Ross Johnson. They both held senior positions at the airline and were both later caught lying during the Royal Commission about the altitude issue. During this briefing, the pilots were shown maps and other materials to help prepare for the journey, including photos of the McMurdo Sound area, maps from 1977 with the approved NDB waypoint, as well as a printout of the flight path that contained Brian Hewitt's typo. Les Simpson and the other pilots at this briefing all testified that they were led to understand the route went down the middle over the water over McMurdo Sound, west of Ross Island, and not over Mount Erebus. However, Wilson and Johnson both staunchly denied this and stated that they had briefed the pilots on the route that would take them over Mount Erebus. On November 14, 1979, the second last Air New Zealand Antarctic flight, captained by Les Simpson, departed. As Simpson flew the plane down McMurdo Sound, following the flight path, he was given the all clear by air traffic control to descend and give passengers a closer look at the stations. Once pilots reached Antarctica, they would usually just fly around freely and manually if the weather was good, which it almost always was, so nobody actually ever flew to the incorrect final waypoint to find out where it was located. As Captain Simpson neared the NDB at McMurdo Station, he happened to check his position and was surprised to see he was a lot farther out than where he expected to be. 
When Simpson got back to New Zealand, he made a phone call to Ross Johnson to let him know there was some kind of discrepancy in the navigational data. However, when Ross Johnson took the stand during the Royal Commission, he denied that Simpson ever brought up an issue with the flight path. Yet Johnson admitted that following this phone call, he asked Brian Hewitt to check the navigational materials. Brian Hewitt did so, but picked up only one of his two errors. He realized that he had plotted the final waypoint at Williams Field when it was supposed to be at the McMurdo Station NDB a couple of miles away. So on the night before Flight 901 was due to depart, he re-entered the coordinates in the airline system, inadvertently fixing his typo and shifting the existing route 27 miles to the east. Because Hewitt believed he had only adjusted the waypoint by a couple of miles, he didn't think it was significant enough to inform the pilots. Justice Peter Mann called it, quote, a remarkable sequence of errors. The lawyer of Jim Collins' estate also flamed Hewitt for his mistakes, calling it, quote, a woeful story. Air New Zealand's argument hinged on the fact that Collins descended without being 100% certain of his position and should have stayed at the minimum safe altitude. The airline blamed Collins despite the issues with the navigational data and argued that Collins should have checked the coordinates himself. Air New Zealand also argued that Collins should have never assumed his position when he began the descent and should have realized something was wrong when radio contact was lost with McMurdo air traffic control because Mount Erebus was blocking the signal. But as we know, Collins was flying visually like all other Antarctic pilots. He was told visibility was good, the whiteout effect made it appear that he was flying over flat ice, and he was never trained to recognize the phenomenon. Would he really have brought the plane down to 1500 feet if he, in his mind, wasn't certain? The pilot's union argued back that Jim Collins did not make any wrong decisions. He trusted Air New Zealand's team of navigators and should not have been expected to pick up on the airline's mistakes. On the 27th of April 1981, Peter Mann's report on the Erebus crash was published. He concluded that the pilots had not made any critical errors, and the overriding cause of the crash was Air New Zealand changing the flight path on the plane system without informing the crew. He found that not only did top-level Air New Zealand personnel make a series of disastrous mistakes, they lied to investigators and conspired to cover up their wrongdoing. One particularly savage line from the report was quoted all over the media. I am forced reluctantly to say that I had to listen to an orchestrated litany of lies. The Mann report sent shockwaves across New Zealand. Justice Peter Mann concluded that there had been a deliberate attempt by Air New Zealand to conceal information and lie about what had really happened in order to put blame on Captain Jim Collins. The inquiry revealed many inconsistencies and dodgy circumstances that would take far too long to explain in this video. Many witness accounts didn't add up. There were other inexplicable errors in Air New Zealand's navigational materials. Jim Collins' diary that was discovered intact and undamaged at the crash site had pages ripped out. Documents had been stolen from the homes of Collins and Greg Casson, and Air New Zealand Chief Executive Maury Davis had ordered the shredding of a huge amount of documents right after the crash site was discovered. After the Marne report came out, 12 Air New Zealand staff members were suspended, including Chief Navigator Brian Hewitt, and Maury Davis gave a press conference and denied all allegations of a cover-up attempt. A week later, he announced his retirement but never once admitted to any wrongdoing. Ron Chippendale wrote a 19-page long press release refuting many points in the report. The New Zealand Prime Minister Robert Muldoon publicly supported the airline and attacked Mann in the media, demanding Mann reveal more evidence to support his litany of lies statement. It was wildly inappropriate that the Prime Minister was publicly disputing the findings of a royal commission. The controversy heightened when it came out that Muldoon had been advised to dispute the report by his lawyer Des Delgady, who also served as the deputy chair of the Air New Zealand board. In October 1981, Air New Zealand brought the Marne report to the Court of Appeal, and a few days before Christmas, a verdict was reached. Three of the five appeal court judges found that Peter Mann had no legal right to brand Air New Zealand as liars or perjurers in his report and should have given the airline a chance to respond. 
what the two other judges said would propel the scandal to another shocking level. They attacked Peter Mann's ability to do his job, criticizing the way he interpreted evidence and passed judgment on it. These two judges, Owen Woodhouse and Duncan McMullen, both had family members who worked for Air New Zealand, and Peter Mann believed they should have stood aside from the case. Mann and Woodhouse also had a long-standing beef, as evidenced in the letters they had written that criticized each other's decisions about other matters in the past. But the appeal verdict was final, and the things that had been said about Peter Mann had tarnished his professional reputation severely. It was now over two years since the fatal crash, and all the public bickering and scandals had overshadowed the 257 lives lost in the tragedy. And after everything, it was still unclear what the definitive cause of the crash was. Peter Mann wanted to resign from his position as a judge on the High Court of New Zealand, but his higher-ups wouldn't allow him, so he decided to go down swinging. He gave an hour-long radio interview attacking Muldoon and said that he didn't think the Prime Minister had even read the report. He was just defending his mates in high places. Muldoon retaliated the following day in a press conference, attacking Mann's character and once again called for him to specifically name who was behind the orchestrated litany of lies. Peter Mann was finally allowed to resign. Although he had ruined his career, he had won the public's favor and came out on top as the hero who stuck it to the man. Mann often had his meals and drinks paid for when he went out, and people on the street would come up to him for a handshake and to express their adulation. Mann submitted his own appeal to the Privy Council in London in October 1983, but it was dismissed. The Privy Council seemed to agree with points made by both Air New Zealand and Mann, but in the end stated that all parties involved should quote, let bygones be bygones. Peter Mann's final card left to play was his tell-all book, Verdict on Erebus, which went on to win the New Zealand Book Award Prize for Nonfiction in 1985. Peter Mann died of heart failure in August 1986. His wife Margarita believes all the stress from the inquiry and the aftermath caused his rapid health decline. Controversy brewed around the Erebus disaster for years afterwards. Several people who were working at McMurdo Station and Scott Base in 1979 have come forward to reveal they were never asked to give their expert testimonies by either Chippendale or Mann. The words orchestrated litany of lies stuck in the New Zealand psyche, and the cover-up scandal ultimately became more well-remembered than the actual crash. There are still many unresolved elements to the story, and sadly, many families and friends of the victims still do not feel satisfied with how it all transpired, and Air New Zealand never apologized for the role it played in causing the accident. In 2009, on the 30th anniversary of the disaster, Air New Zealand's chief executive Rob Fife apologized to the families of the victims for not offering them support and compassion immediately following the crash. In 2019, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern, who wasn't even born when the Erebus crash happened, finally apologized on behalf of the government and airline for its actions that caused the crash. A national memorial for the victims was also announced, but a location for it has not been chosen yet. The wreckage of Air New Zealand Flight 901 still remains on the northern slope of Mount Erebus today due to the inaccessibility of the crash site.